understanding EMC Basics 3, Grounding, Immunity, Overviews of Emissions and Immunity, and Crosstalk. My name is Belinda Stachukevich, and I'm the editor of Interference Technology. Established in 1970, Interference Technology helps EMI and EMC engineers find solutions to their various testing, design, application, and regulatory issues by publishing articles, news, and other practical content. This webinar is presented by Keith Armstrong. Keith graduated from Imperial College London in 1972 with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, specializing in analog circuit design and electromagnetic field theory. He formed Cherry Clough Consultants Limited in 1990, which provides design services to help achieve compliance with EMC. They currently have nearly 800 satisfied customers in almost all areas where electronics are used. This webinar is the third in a series following the success of Keith's previous webinars. The first in the series, Understanding EMC Basics 1, EM Field Theory and Three Types of EM Analysis, which took place February 27th, and Understanding EMC Basics 2, Waveform, Spectra, Coupling, and Overview of Emissions, which took place May 29th. Hopefully many of you attended these previous webinars. If not, they're available for viewing on our website, interferencetechnology.com, and we encourage you to check them out. This webinar will be interactive. You'll be able to ask questions and answer polls, and we encourage you to participate. Take a look at your GoToWebinar navigation pane, the box on the right-hand corner of your screen. If at any time you have a question, we ask you to fill out the type box and hit send. To make the screen minimize and maximize, click the arrow button. To raise your hand to ask a question or report an issue, click the hand icon. We'll present the topic for 45 minutes followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. Now Keith will begin the presentation. Thanks Belinda. Um, I just noticed on the GoToWebinar screen there's a, there's a button called Mark Change Presenter. So if I don't do well enough, am I going to get hooked off and somebody else put in my place? <laughs> Who's the thought? Anyway. Um, Yes, welcome everybody. Uh, this is what we're doing today, the third in, in the series, and I hope everybody uh, attended the first two, but as Belinda said, if you didn't, then uh, you can uh, download them from the Interference Technology website. So you see here, um, there's a list of uh, contents, and we covered one to nine uh, in the previous two webinars. I have an apology to make because the title set includes overview of emissions, but we actually covered that in webinar two, so it's my fault for not being careful enough with the titling. So we've done an overview of emissions, today we're going to talk about uh, immunity mostly, after we've dealt with uh, safety, earthing and grounding, which doesn't help EMC at radio frequencies. Now, I haven't been mentioning uh, grounding or earthing in, in any of my previous uh, two webinars. The reason is the, the terms are widely misused and misunderstood. And it's a cause of a lot of problems in many projects where different people working on different aspects of a project have called different things ground. And when you come to integrate the whole thing, of course, it doesn't work. So it's best to use the terms like ground or earth um, only for safety and never use them for circuit design or EMC. Have naught volts analog, naught volts digital, have um, whatever, you know, just, just call them different names. You might even have a chassis, but don't think that the chassis is an earth or a ground. It's a chassis, it's a metal connection. Anyway. <clears throat> The, the green and yellow wire in the mains lead, or the green wire in some countries, um, which connects you to the protective uh, grounding or earthing system, has little effect at frequencies more than 100 kilohertz anyway, for two reasons. One is because it's a wire, it has far too much inductance, it has about one microhenry per meter, um, which at a megahertz would be 6.3 ohms, and at a gigahertz would be 630 ohms. Is that right? 6,300 ohms. That's right. Sorry. But um, in fact, at a gigahertz, a one meter long piece of wire would be resonant anyway. So it could have an impedance that was anywhere between uh, nothing, well, the resistance of the wire, 
and uh, you know several thousand ohms, several tens of thousands of ohms. So um, it's no good. A wire is no good as a ground. And any wire is an accidental antenna, just like all other wires and conductors are. We covered this in webinar two. So any wire, any PCB trace is an antenna. A much wiser man than me once called the safety grounding system in a building uh, an interference redistribution network. And he was very right. So one of the things with earth your ground is that many people have this idea that they're, it's some kind of infinite sink for unwanted current. So if you've got some you know, radio frequency noise that you don't want, then you connect it with a capacitor to the ground and, and it sees that as a low impedance path and goes away and disappears. And that, that can't happen. Okay? It's a fallacy. It never has happened. It's not capable of happening. Okay? If you think you saw it happening, what was happening was something else, in fact, that had a similar effect. According to all the laws of physics, any and all differential mode and comma mode stray currents can only flow in closed loops. A current can only flow in a closed loop. There's no way a current cannot flow in a closed loop. So <clears throat> if you have a, a safety ground or earth, it can only carry current if it's part of a circuit loop. Certainly it's not some kind of infinite sink where you just, you know, like a hole in the ground that you put your unwanted currents and disappear. So, we want to have an, an EMC ground or radio frequency ground. Uh, what can we do to make one? And how do we connect to it, which we call bonding, electrical bonding? I call uh, a radio frequency ground a radio frequency reference because, like I said before, you don't want to use the word ground because somebody else will think you mean something else. Call it a specific name like RF reference. And what it is, is the conductive area, as large as you can make it, if you have a very small product, then it's not going to be very large, obviously, and it's not going to be very marvelous. But it's the large metal area, um, like a chassis or a zero volt plane in the PCB, or the inside surface of a conductive enclosure. And the better the conductive enclosure is at shielding, the better it is at providing an RF reference. But that's not all. It also has to be very nearby. It has to be much closer than lambda over 10 at the highest frequency of concern, F max. Um, and putting it in F max terms, that's 30 over F max. This is assuming that we're, it's all surrounded by air, of course. If you're going to be under water or in, a, in an oil tank, then it's a bit less than 30. Much closer spacing is better, less than lambda over 100 will be better, like 3 over F max. If we give F max in megahertz, then these little formulae here, uh, inequalities rather, um, give the results in meters. If you give the frequency in gigahertz, then you get the answer in millimeters. So if we say 1 gigahertz, then lambda over 10 is 30 over 1, 30 millimeters. If we said 1,000 1, megahertz, that becomes 30 over 1,000 meters. Lo and behold, it's 30 millimeters. Anything that's further away than a tenth of a wavelength isn't part of your grounding structure. Okay? It's like, um, uh, well, Eric Bogatin has written about this sort of thing. It's a bit like being in a, in a fog, in a mist. If you're a one megahertz sine wave, if you're a one megahertz signal, then you can see for about uh, 75 meters before it all starts to get a bit furry. If you're a one gigahertz signal, you can see for about 30 millimeters, 30 millimeters before everything disappears in the fog. So the only things you can grab onto are, you know, your, your grounds, the only ground you can grab onto to, to give you some support is something you can see. It has to be less than a tenth of a wavelength at the highest frequency of which you're concerned about. We call a connection to the radio frequency reference plane radio frequency bonding. And the radio frequency bonding should achieve less than an ohm at the maximum frequency. And that's interesting because 
a via hole in the printed circuit board. Say you have a via hole, or a via hole if you prefer, one and a half millimeters long. At a gigahertz, it, well, one and a half millimeters long, that's about one and a half nanohenries. It doesn't sound very much, but a gigahertz, that's about 10 ohms. So that tells us straight away that if we're trying to connect anything on a printed circuit board to an inner plane, then a single via hole is not going to be a very good bond. It's about 10 times more than we want at a gigahertz. Never mind 10 gigahertz. Anyway, we prefer direct metal to metal connections. They give us the best radio frequency bonds, the lowest impedances at the high frequency. If we have to join two conductive parts together, maybe the body of a filter and a chassis or something, you know, where the chassis is the radio frequency reference, then I've got a spelling mistake. Sorry, excuse me a second. They should, look at that. I changed this last night, you see. My mistake, that's better. They should be radio frequency bonded at multiple points, multiple bonding, okay, with equal spacing, less than number over 10 apart, along the entire perimeter of the seam or the joint. So equally spaced along the entire perimeter. Single point bonding can't work. Um, it just creates resonances. So when you hear people talking about single point grounding as being a good EMC technique, tell them they're wrong. And if they don't believe you, then you can refer them to a whole loads of stuff that I've written. I'll give them my email address and I'll tell them they're wrong. Single point bonding just creates resonances. Ideally, if you're going to join two conductive parts, you'd seam weld along the joint. This is how the military builds things designed to withstand nuclear attacks, for instance. Um, or you might seam solder, or you might put a continuous conductive gasket all around the perimeter. But I have to say that you might be able to use multiple wide braid straps if they're quite short, say less than six inches, 150 millimeters. And if they're spaced less than 100 over 10 apart along the entire boundary of the joint, this might be okay, but probably not to any frequencies higher than 100 megahertz. Because it depends on the sizes of the things you're joining, you see, and their stray capacitance and all that sort of stuff. So, the previous slides in this and in the other two webinars in this series are equally valid for emissions and immunity because they're all concerned with controlling the propagation of electric and magnetic and electromagnetic fields, which is what we normally call electrical signals and power. In the first webinar, I, I said that you know, electrical signals and power are really propagating electromagnetic waves. You know, that's what they are. It's not electrons jostling down a wire, for instance. And the techniques for controlling propagation of electric, magnetic, electromagnetic fields are equally valid whether you're trying to reduce emissions or improve immunity. And in fact, they'll um, improve both at the same time. Because you're reducing the coupling with the noise source. Or, yeah, depending, it doesn't matter whether you're trying to reduce emissions or trying to improve immunity, you're reducing the coupling. But there are some additional topics that we have to cover that concern immunity only. And as you saw on the title page they had a, uh, on the previous slide, these are nonlinearity. Now, nonlinearities give us demodulation and intermodulation. So, demodulation and intermodulation are the consequences of nonlinearity. In a linear material like a resistor, um, the output is linearly proportional to the input. You know, you put one volt across a resistor, you get, I don't know, one milliamp. If you put 10 volts across, you get 10 milliamps. 10 milliamps. All semiconductors, though, are nonlinear, starting with rectifiers and working upwards. And some oxidized electrical connections are nonlinear, too. This is the so-called rusty bolt effect, um, which you may have read about. If, if not, try Googling it, rusty bolt effect. So because they're nonlinear, they tend to rectify AC signals. And RF signals, of course, are alternating current. In a radio receiver, this is called demodulation. 
or sometimes RF detection, and we want it to happen. So we actually use the nonlinear characteristics of the semiconductors to do our to detect our radio frequency signal and convert it into something that we can hear, a frequency range that we can hear. So there's a linear response, you see. The output is linear proportionally, but the slope might change, but it's a straight line. And as an, as an example of a nonlinear response, where there's not a, a direct relationship between the two. Well, not a linear relationship between the two, I should say. People often say to me, especially people in the instrumentation or audio businesses, they say, oh, my, my op amps are so slow that, that I don't have to do anything about EMI because they won't see the radio frequency. Well, here's an example, a real life example. This is taken from a test that I was helping somebody with in the, in the 90s. That's the 1990s. And it was basically a very simple industrial circuit. It was a, a, volt, a voltage to frequency converter and it used an LM324, which at the time was the lowest cost quad op amp that you could buy. It had a gain bandwidth product of one megahertz, and with 40 dBs of gain, you'll see its, it's actual um, linear bandwidth was very, very small, just a few kilohertz. And we were using an RF test signal at 10 volts per meter, with one kilohertz modulation, because it was for an industrial application, one kilohertz sine wave modulation. Here's a product spec, the percentage error and the, in the voltage to frequency conversion, was spec to 0.1%. That's equivalent to minus 60 dBs, or 10 bits of resolution, like a 10-bit ATD converter or something. And as we swept the frequency from 30 megahertz to a gigahertz, this is what we got. Now, this much I'd been expecting, because these are the resonant frequencies of the cables. There's a DC cable, 24 volts, there's an input cable, an output cable, and because of their lengths and their terminations and the way they were coiled up, um, they had certain resonant frequencies. So here's, we ha here's what we have, the a cable, one of the cables, don't know which one, acting as a, a resonator, a tuned antenna, putting a high level of voltage on the op amp, and the op amp is demodulating it, giving us a big error signal. This is actually a kilohertz signal here. What I wasn't expecting was this slope here, and what's happening here is that the printed circuit board traces, which are only quite small, are starting to become effective little dipole antennas, and connecting the RF directly into the pins of the IC, rather than it having to come along a length of cable, which tends to uh, have a bit of loss. Now look here, see the error uh, at 500 megahertz was 0.1% and the error at a gigahertz was half a percent and it wasn't rolling off. Now does this look like a, a 1 megahertz gain bandwidth product to you? Because it is. You see, in an op amp like this, uh, they use dominant pole compensation. They have a, uh, a big capacitor inside which slugs the response, but the transistors in the op amp are little tiny microscopic things and because they're so small, they work very well at gigahertz. And so, I don't know where this would fall off, but actually, when you test these things to many gigahertz, they, they often tend to roll off about 10 gigahertz on, or, or, or maybe more. Um, so it just takes one of the diode junctions, one of the rectifying junctions in the transistor, like the base emitter or something, um, to do this demodulation. Bingo, you've got a baseband signal. It's, in, it's, in, it's a kilohertz, you know? It passes through the amplifier. So that's a good example. When you have two or more frequencies simultaneously present in a nonlinear device, then we get into modulation, which is new frequencies created from the sums and the differences, and then from the sums and differences of, of the new frequencies and so on. It gets very complicated if you have more than three frequencies. In fact, I've only ever really tried it with three frequencies. If you go on the internet, you can find intermodulation tables, because the radio frequency transmitting tower people have to worry about this sort of thing. And um, you can find on the internet tables of um, IP products, intermodulation products. So let's take an example. 
let's imagine we've got a circuit and we've got two noise frequencies on it in it at the same time. So this is like an ordinary 61,043 radiated immunity test. But instead of having one frequency, we've got two. If you put an antenna up in the normal, any kind of normal environment, um, you will see dozens of frequencies, all sorts of broadcast channels, all sorts of private mobile, all sorts of um, stuff going on in there. So in the real life, we always have multiple uh, noise sources. And in our test, we only use one. So here we've got an example of two. The first thing is we get some rectification, some demodulation. And we get a baseband. That's, how, that's the radio detection working there. That's the signal we would hear in our, over our loudspeaker or something from our radio set. But also, rectification gives us harmonics. And we've got the second harmonics of F1 and, and of F2 here. Uh, obviously, they've got third and fourth, fifth and sixth, but they're off the scale, so I haven't, can't plot them. And that's the effect of rectification, is to give us demodulation and harmonics. And now let's look at the intermodulation. First off, we have the first order IP products, which is, no, I've, I've actually drawn the second order as well. The first order ones are F2 minus F1, which given the frequencies I've chosen there, gives us a signal at 100 megahertz. Then the other one is F1 plus F2, which gives us a signal at 900 megahertz. They're lower than the F1 and F2. In fact, the scale's all wrong. They should be about 6 dBs down. Um, not, as it looks like, about 30 dBs down. Maybe 6 dBs down. Then we have 2F1 minus F2. Where does 2F1 come from? It's the second harmonic of F1 minus F2. Then we have the second harmonic of F2 minus F1, which is up here. And then we, we would also see, if I could be bothered to draw them, 3F1, the third harmonic, which is over here somewhere, 3F1 minus F2, and 3F1 minus 2F2, and 3F2 minus F1, and 3F2 minus 2F1, and so on. So, uh, but each time you go up an order, you know, the, the second harmonics intermodulating and the third harmonics, the fourth harmonics, the, the levels drop down a bit. Here's a, a simulation of a diode fed by a resistor. Perfect diode fed through a 1K resistor. And we're feeding it with two radio frequency signals at 850 and 850 megahertz. There they are. Those two little spikes there. In a linear circuit, that's all you'd get. You'd have noise and these two spikes. But because it's a non-linear circuit, being a rectifier, we get um, harmonics. Second harmonics, just those two there. Third harmonics, those two there. Fourth harmonics, those two there. Fifth harmonics, so on. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way off here. We're going to about 100 gigahertz, you see. And we get into modulation products. So there's the first order IPs. Now, 875 eight minus 850 gives us 25 megahertz. There it is, 25 megahertz. And that's 6 dBs down on the basic frequencies. And then we have F1 plus F2, which is, uh, whatever it is, 1725, 1825 megahertz or something. There it is, there, at that point there. That's the first order IPs. Then we have the second order IPs, making a little, uh, and then the third and fourth and fifth. Now, the thirds and fourths and fifths, the second, thirds and fourths and fifths, tend to look like sidebands around the, the harmonics. See, it's like they've got sidebands. And at the, the low frequency end, we get this, this chain. Now, theoretically, you'd expect them to just keep diminishing, but you see there's some kind of sophisticated structure in here. I think this is what they call the sine x over x response. And I'm just about running out of what I understand, so I'll stop talking about that. Anyway, look how complex uh, a spectrum we get from a single diode with two frequencies. In real life, our products have thousands of diodes, because each transistor has two, and multiple frequencies the frequencies that are in the circuit, as well as the noise that's coming in. Right, time for some poll questions. Over to you, Belinda. Okay, thanks, Keith. Uh, we'd like to ask the audience some poll questions. Uh, a good, gr a gr excuse me, a good radio frequency, or EMC ground, is? 
the green or green striped yellow wire in the mains lead or a large metal area that is very nearby? We'll give you a few seconds to answer the question. We're getting some answers in. A lot of you answered correctly. 99% of you answered B, which is correct. Keith, um, can you show your screen? Is there a button that pops up? Keith? Yes, I can hear you. I, I, I clicked on the button. Is there a button that pops up? We just see that the screen is going back to the, um, the waiting room. Should we just continue with another poll question? I click on the button. Should I? Let's go to another poll in the that, meantime. Is that better? Uh, well, right now we're going to just do another poll for everybody. Um, all semiconducting junctions are linear or nonlinear? We'll give everybody a few more seconds. Everybody's pretty good at these, getting a lot of correct answers, which would be B, not linear. And we'll go to one more poll. Nonlinearities in circuits cause multiple RF waveforms to be demodulated, creating harmonics, intermodulated, creating new frequencies, or both demodulated and intermodulated. We'll give everybody a few seconds. Answers are still coming in. Okay. And the majority also answered correctly again, both demodulated and intermodulated. Okay. So is it back to me now? It appears that the waiting room is still on the screen. Hold on one second. You know, keep having this problem, don't we? Okay, Keith, uh, you could probably click the show your screen button now. How about that? Can you just Sorry, everybody, questions? we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Okay, here we go. All right, back to you, Keith. Sorry about that. <laughs> this, this catches us out every time, doesn't it? This particular one. Anyway, so let's carry on then. Um, well done on the poll, by the way. Makes me wonder why you're, why you're listening to me, if you know it all already. So, uh, we have three interference mechanisms. Here's some electromagnetic phenomena in the environment. don't know what they are. And they're conducted, radiated, continuous, transient, whatever. Anyway, they couple into conductors, and that's how they get into our circuits. Okay, they couple into the conductors. It might be the bond wire on an integrated circuit, but it's still a conductor. So the conductor acts like an antenna, picks up the noise, the noise currents and voltages in the conductor. If they're in the frequency range of the wanted signal, which is especially a problem for audio or instrumentation or video, um, then we get a noise actually in the signal. And you can't filter it out, of course, because it's in the wrong frequency range. It's not radio frequency anymore. Well, it's not radio frequency anyway, it's in the frequency range of the signal. Um, now, if we gradually increase the magnitude of the interference, we'll see direct interference with the waveforms of the clocks and other digital processes, and of course with software. Now, the reason for that is that the digital circuits have some noise immunity, so-called noise margin. And a, a good design will have quite a good noise margin, but once you exceed that noise margin, all bets are off. It's sometimes called the digital cliff. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine, and suddenly it's haywire. Whereas with an analog circuit, for instance, an audio circuit, you know, audio analog circuit, as you increase the noise level, it just gets louder and louder. You know, it's it's um, proportional. If you increase the level some more, <clears throat> then we get high levels of shift, bias shifts in the transistors, in the ICs or wherever. And so the transistors won't work properly. So it's not that we're getting waveforms with noise on them and it's interfering with stuff. The transistors actually won't work properly. 
because they're saturated or something like that. And if we keep increasing the level even more, we can destroy uh, transistors because they're really very small, very tiny. Um, I was reading just this morning that in the latest Intel um, microprocessors, they put in PCs and things, you can fit 4,000 transistors across the width of a human hair. 4,000 in a row. That's how small they are. And of course, being small, they're very weak and easily damaged. But this business of permanent damage is more likely to be caused by, for instance, something with high energy like electrostatic discharge um, or surges, which are kilovolt surges, that sort of thing. But if it's just like radio frequency noise, then this is really only a worry for military people who have to deal with uh, sometimes intense amounts of radio frequency noise. So that's just the coupled noise directly. But then we get the rectified coupled noise, which produces baseband noise and harmonics. And of course, these are at different frequencies from the radio frequency that they started off at. And so they can cause all of these things. Because the, the rectified signal is generally lower in amplitude than the basic signal, it's unlikely that you're going to see much damage happening, but it is possible. And then the same applies with intermodulation. Uh, we've got the, the coupled noise and we've got the harmonics. So we get the sums and differences of the noise frequencies and the harmonics, and they can cause all of those problems too. A good example, many, many years ago in the, in the 1980s, I worked in professional audio and made mixing uh, desks. And um, at that time, Sony came out with the first digital audio multi-track tape recorder. It was a wonderful thing. Um, sort of two-inch wide magnetic tape going across big reels. It's digital recording then. But I was told, I never had the experience, I was told the very first models had a whistle in the audio. And what it was, was that they were sampling the, the audio, the A to D converters were sampling at 41 kilohertz. But they had switch mode power converters in there to switching around 40, 45 kilohertz. And so um, the 45 minus the 41 gave you a three kilohertz whistle. And because the frequencies of the switch mode converters was not, were not crystal controlled and varied with temperature and stuff and low and stuff like that, um, they would fluctuate a little bit. So this whistle would warble around all over the place. So that's internal noises. We'll talk about internal EMC later on. But internal noises, the, the switching clock and the uh, noise from the switch mode converters, intermodulating in the analog circuits and causing a whistle. They dealt with it by phase locking the switch mode converters to the audio clock. So maybe running them at twice the rate at 82 kilohertz or something like that, which meant that all the intermodulation products were ultrasonic and they all stayed fixed in frequency anyway. Let's have an example of intermodulation. Um, our normal, here we are in a test lab. We're doing normal immunity testing with a single frequency swept across the frequency range. Let's say it's 150 kilohertz to a gig. And it, we find we've got some susceptibility over the range 50 to 200 megahertz. So being good EMC engineers, we apply filtering and shielding effective over that frequency range and we improve it until the equipment passes the test. We pat ourselves on the back, sign the test certificate and go on to the next project. However, we didn't add protection, intentionally anyway, from 200 megahertz to a gig because it wasn't necessary to pass the test. And it would have probably added more cost and maybe more weight as well, so we didn't want to do that. But the result of that is, if you get multiple frequencies, say you had, for argument's sake, 900 megahertz and 970 megahertz in the environment, we haven't filtered them out so they can get into the circuit where individually they don't do any harm. But they intermodulate and one of the intermodulation frequencies would be 70 megahertz, which is right in the middle of the range where we have problems. So um, we get immunity problems and we can't see it. When you first have this problem happening, 
you wonder how on earth this frequency is getting inside because you've got this very good filtering. But it's because it's only being created inside from frequencies that you haven't filtered out, which you're allowed to get in because individually on the single frequency test they don't cause a problem. So this is one way, one of the many ways in which equipment that passes its uh, EMC tests can actually still fail in real life. At the last webinar we had an overview of emissions and I said basically um, you can think of every, inter uh, every solid state thing that we make as a bunch of uh, noise sources which is basically the, the active devices, the transistors switching and doing stuff and making noise. I mean, it's not noise to you, but it is noise to somebody else. And connected to loads and loads of tuned antennas, which are just basically cables and things. And uh, I find that quite helpful when, when I'm getting overwhelmed with complexity. Pull back and think, well, it's just actually a bunch of noise sources and a bunch of tuned antennas. And it's the same thing with um, uh, for immunity. All the semiconductor circuits are accidental radio tuners. The, the actual radio detection, if you like, is done by rectification, accidental demodulators. And you can think of an intermodulator, if you've got two frequencies coming in, um, it, then one superheterodynes off the other, and so you've got an accidental superheterodyne receiver. But this is just a diodes and transistors in the ICs and power devices, that's all. And it's coupled to thousands of tuned antennas, which is basically all the PCB traces, wires and cables, metal structures, slots and gaps in shields, and so on. And they all have resonant frequencies, which is what makes them tuned antennas. They have multiple resonant frequencies that depend on their dimensions, their build conditions, their terminations, the way they're routed, you know, are they coiled up, are they lying around, are they lying on a piece of metal, whatever. And proximity to other conductors and materials. Um, so that's the, so it's really it, it's very easy to get overwhelmed with EMC problems and as, an, as a, an independent consultant I have to be able to deal with with just about well with everything you know people ring me up and I never know or they email me more likely I never know what they're going to ask me anyway one day I found myself in my car driving down the the M1 motorway in Britain to uh, a customer was having a problem with um, immunity, radio frequency immunity, of a supercomputer they were building. And I was about halfway down the motor and I thought, what do I know about supercomputers? And I, I thought a bit and I realized I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. Well, they've got transistors and integrated circuits in them and it's digital and that's about it, you know. I thought I'm going to look a right fool when I turn up at this, this place and I don't understand anything they're telling me. I thought I should just uh, pull off at the next service station and phone in sick, you know, make some excuse. But I didn't. I carried on and, and as I was sort of idly mulling the problem over, I realized it's really very simple. But whatever it is, if it's a, you know, a thing with integrated circuits and transistors in it, whatever it is, it's just basically a bunch of um, radio tuners connected to a bunch of antennas. It doesn't matter what it's doing, it could be controlling an industrial process, it could be somebody's television, or it could be, in this case, a supercomputer. It doesn't matter what it's actually doing. In reality, it's just a bunch of radio tuners and some tuned antennas. And, you know, um, I needn't have worried because I, I fixed the problem for them soon after the morning coffee break. It didn't even take me half a day by looking at it in this way. So it's a very powerful technique. And see how good I am. Uh, I'm giving away all my very powerful techniques to you to use for free. It's a free webinar, right? All this stuff that took me years and years and you know to realize I'm giving it away. Why not? You're nice people. Finally then, um, we want to talk about, or rather I want to talk about internal EMC, which is, well, you'll see in a minute. It's EMC interactions inside equipment or the, not EMC, electromagnetic interactions inside equipment. For our ordinary EMC compliance, we're concerned with passing tests and stuff and actually working properly in the external environment. That's what EMC is all about. But 
we get interactions also between devices and traces and wires inside an item equipment. The, the power currents are still propagating electromagnetic waves, and so are the signals. So they interact. Now, quite often they interact in the near field. Come to that in a minute. We care about these interactions, of course, because they affect the number of design iterations that it takes us to get the product working with the functional specs that we want, and, it, and that affects our time to market. And time to market, by the way, <clears throat> time to market is the most important thing. Since the year 2000, or thereabouts, time to market has been the most important thing for financial success of a product than the cost of the bill of materials. You may well have a, a manager who thinks it's still the bill of materials, but that's because they're out of date. And I can send you a document uh, where they, they did the survey that proved this anyway. If you want to email me, I'll tell them I'll send it to you. Also, internal interactions can affect reliability and warranty costs. And I say we might call this issue internally and say, well, that's what I call it, internal electromagnetic compatibility. And usually, this is the thing that, that delays projects the most. You've got somebody's designed the power supply, somebody's designed the, the video drivers, somebody else has designed the, um, uh, the, the microprocessor circuit, and somebody else has designed the software, somebody else has designed some analog inputs and outputs and digital inputs and outputs, all of different printed circuit boards, and you plug them all together, and the one thing you can guarantee is that they won't work, or they won't work very well. And mostly, in, in my experience, because I was 20 years in product design and product design management before I went independent, um, mostly it's things interfering with each other inside the equipment. I look at it, the world of electromagnetic compatibility like this. There's a great big apple or something. Split it in two. We've got external EMC and internal EMC. There's the real world of external EMC. There's the, the coverage that we get from doing tests in EMC test laboratories. If you wanted to try and test the real world, you'd be in the test laboratory for about a thousand years, covering all the possibilities. So uh, that's not going to work. In the, the internal EMC world, we have signal to noise ratio, overshoot, eye closure if you're looking at high speed digital serial links, power integrity clock jitter. We also have noise margin, ringing, um, signal integrity, crosstalk, and so on and so on. All these words, phrases that we've developed over the years, and there's plenty more, to talk about um, imperfections in our signals or our power or something. But they're all, from one point of view anyway, internally MC. Now, the stuff I've been talking about in these three webinars about controlling field patterns and, and all the rest of it, and intermodulation, demodulation, and stuff like that, uh, applies equally well whether we're talking about external or internal EMC. People often call um, uh, the, the most famous or the most common internal electromagnetic interaction is, is usually called crosstalk. It's analyzed in terms of stray capacitance and stray mutual inductance. So you may have a digital trace that's running too close to an analog trace, for instance, on a PCB, and you get some, uh, some digital noise coming out in the, in the analog signal. But the stray capacitance and stray mutual inductance is a lumped analysis approach. Only works when you're in the near field. We covered near field in webinar one. In the near field of the electromagnetic field emissions from the noise source in this case, the digital trace. But this is becoming inadequate increasingly because we now employ very high frequencies like clock harmonics, for instance, and they have such short wavelengths that parts of the inside equipment are in their far field. The near field approach doesn't work anymore. It's more like a traditional radio frequency coupling with antennas sort of situation. The PCB traces, the heat sinks, even the devices themselves can behave well, do behave, not can behave, do behave as resident accidental antennas. And you can't estimate these far field interactions, even though it might only be 100 millimeters, you know, or 50 millimeters. If it's in the far field, you can't estimate them by using lumped analysis methods. 
you need to use transmission line or two or three D field solver methods. Suddenly it becomes much more complex. If we the this webinar <coughs> or the series of webinars is actually the first uh, module in a, a two or three day training course that I do, which then goes on to talk about good EMC design techniques based on this information, this knowledge that we've, we've gained here. So um, when you use these good EMC design techniques throughout a project, for instance, choosing components which have good EMC performance, uh, designing circuits for good EMC, designing software for good EMC, uh, designing the board um, and laying out the board for good EMC, decoupling the board, for instance, um, doing designing cables and connectors for good EMC and doing mechanical packaging for good EMC. There's, there's good EMC techniques at every stage. There's also good EMC techniques in project management as well, but we're not here to talk about management. If you use these good techniques throughout a project, then you control the field patterns inside the product, which means you get much less crosstalk and noise coupling and everything inside the product. Of course, we do the usual EMC shielding and filtering as well. Anyway, by using this approach, we control the internal EMC as well as the external EMC. And this reduces the project costs and timescales because we need fewer iterations, design iterations, to get the functional spec we want. In fact, my experience has been over the last 20 odd years that using these good techniques throughout gives you better functional performance than you were expecting. It's quite surprising sometimes. So we don't need so many design iterations, so the project cost and timescales are reduced. And getting to market quicker is very quickly, very quickly, it's very important these days. And we, we get our pass our EMC tests you know, without any great problems, maybe have to modify a filter value or something. It'll reduce the product's overall cost of manufacture too because we'll be spending less money on filtering and shielding. We're generally going to have filtering and shielding, but we won't need such expensive, such costly filtering and shielding um, because we've dealt with a lot of the EMC, for instance, in the board design where it costs a lot less. Well, that's actually the end, um, but I've got at the end some useful references. And I'm not going to uh, go through these. These are just there if you want to look at some simple formulae, some useful formulae. Here's a formula for some formulae for emissions, for differential mode and common mode emissions. Here's some formulae for differential mode voltage noise pickup from external electric and magnetic fields. Um, that's the differential mode voltage noise from a magnetic field. That's the differential mode voltage noise from an electric field. Um, this is, these are simplified formulae for common mode, common mode voltage noise pickup from external electric fields. This is for a, mo a short monopole, like a wire, and this is for a small loop. And there's some references to, to my books. Um, and I make that you can only get them from this website here. Um, they're not available from Amazon. If you go onto Amazon, it'll say they're out of print. Well, they're not out of print. It says Amazon are just peeved because uh, we won't let them take 60% of our profits. If we if we publish them through Amazon, we couldn't afford to color print them. And they'd be boring black and white prints instead, which aren't as good. Anyway, and there's also some other books. Uh, my colleague Tim Williams has a very good book. Many of you will have his EMC for product designers, but you may not have the fourth edition, and you should, because it's very good. I've got one. Um, Todd Hubing, Professor Todd Hubing at Clemson University, used to be with um, Missouri Roller, uh, has got some very useful stuff on this website here, some little um, uh, programs for calculating things and what have you. And rfcafe.com, it's a very handy place for skin depth. Now, we talked about skin depth in, I think it was webinar two, and the properties of various metals. There's also, also lots of other useful radio frequency stuff at RF Cafe. Anyway, that's the end. We're going to have some poll questions, and then we'll wrap up. Over to you, Belinda. 
Thanks, Keith. You know what? Unfortunately, I think we're going to hold off on the poll questions because we we're having some difficulties with our platform. And for that, I apologize, everybody. Um, oh. You know what? Everyone seemed to do really well on the first three. So I think that uh, they aren't missing out too much. But we're going to go on to some questions. Um, we'd like to have a call for final questions. Please enter any last questions you may have in the navigation pane. We have received quite a few inquiries on where to get additional information on this topic. There is a vast amount of content found on our website, interferencetechnology.com, and Keith's website, cherryclough.com. You can also email us at info at interferencetechnology.com with specific needs, and we can direct you accordingly. Keith, here's a question for you. You mentioned reliability, but how does good EMC design improve this? Well, um, a, a lot of reliability problems in, in real life are, are caused by EMI. The trouble is that EMI, electromagnetic interference, is invisible, and all that people know is that their, um, their things stop working or it made a funny noise or something. Funny enough, uh, with, with televisions, everybody's going over to digital televisions, or already has gone over. With analog televisions, you used to see interference on the screen sometimes. If somebody went past with an unsuppressed motorbike, for instance, you'd see uh, lines flickering across the, across the screen. It was very annoying. But with digital television, it's this digital cliff business that I mentioned before. Um, you don't see any interference because the error correction routines are dealing with it. But once you get so much interference that the error correction routines can't deal with it, what happens is the picture just blanks. So lots of people are taking their digital TVs back to the, uh, the shop and saying, it's broken, it doesn't work. But it works perfectly well in the shop. You know? but in their place, at their house, it doesn't work at all, or it um, just keeps stopping, uh, uh, stopping working. In fact, I know one guy who bought a, a television, a flat panel TV, for his kitchen, and um, it wouldn't work at all. And he got the aerial guy out, and they put in new cables to the aerial on the roof and all the rest of the antenna. And, it, and then he still couldn't get this TV to work at all. He got several back from the shop several new ones, and then none of them would work. And then he just moved the, the decked handset that was in the kitchen. He just happened to move it a few inches further away, and lo and behold, the television worked again. The little decked handset had been sitting there, uh, blanking out the picture on the television. Now, if it had been an analog television, you would have seen the interference on the screen, you see. But being a digital TV, all he got was a blank screen. So he just assumed it wasn't working. Anyway. Great story about um, how EMI is often not understood as a source of reliability problems. In the, I think I've got time, haven't I, Belinda? In the uh, early 2000s, the European direct, EMC Directive Immunity Standards got beefed up, and they added modulation to the RF testing. They also added surge testing. Now, surges happen all the time due to uh, lightning. It doesn't even have to be nearby lightning and it can be cloud to cloud lightning. Surges happen all the time, but the original EMC immunity test hadn't included a surge test. The new ones did. And there's one guy uh, who um, I was told by a test lab manager had a small company, and he was a technical director of this company. And so he, he took all his product range to the test lab and tested them to the new immunity standards. And, and uh, where they failed, he modified them until they passed. But he complained bitterly about stupid Brussels bureaucrats imposing things on people and you know that, that they had no clue what it was like running a company in the real world and the profit margins and, and all the rest of it. And um, anyway, he moaned and moaned and moaned the whole time. It cost him £170,000 uh, to pay for the testing and to modify all these products. Now that's a significant amount of money. That's about oh, well, over a quarter of a million US dollars at current exchange rates, probably nearly 300000 300, US dollars. So, a significant amount of money, but their first year of operating, selling the new products, their warranty claims fell uh, by, by two million pounds. It's about three million dollars. Now, if you, if you go, as you know, if you go to your financial VP or something and say, look, uh, you know, I, I need a quarter of a million dollars to, he'll stop you. He'll say, I'm sorry, there's no money. Haven't you heard? You know, go away. Stop bothering me. But if you go, if you happen to meet your financial VP over the water cooler, and you say, 
you know, you know, I, I've realized we could save uh, $3 million a year on warranty claims, warranty costs. And he'll say, oh, what would it take? I'll say, well, um, about $300,000. So, well, well, how soon will it start paying back? I'll say, well, immediately, you know, as soon as I get the modifications done and the testing. Oh, well, he'll say, here's the money. He'll probably write you a check there and then, or whatever it takes, you know. Uh, because there's always money available if you can make a good business case. And one of the things that we engineers don't know is, to, is, to make a good, is how to make a good business case. And the, the first rule is you, you state the benefits first, you know, $3 million in a year, every year, for an investment of 300000 It's a no-brainer, you know, it's actually a no-brainer. Anyway, sorry, I'm waffling on here. Got another question, Belinda? Yes, I do. Uh, surely a braid strap that has a length to width ratio of five makes a perfect RF bond? Well, this is, this is an old um, myth, I don't know if it's an urban myth, but, and nobody knows where it came from, but I've been looking at some old military um, documents where they're from the 50s and the 60s, and they were discovering things about, about bonding, you know, radio receivers to the decks of ships and things. And it seems that somebody found that for a particular situation, uh, a braid strap that was, um, I think it was like nine and a half inches long or something, if it was uh, quite wide, you know, about a fifth as wide as it was long, then it made this radio receiver work just fine. It's just, you know, getting the resonance in the structure out of the range of the radio receiver covered. And people have sort of taken this and used it as if there's something magic about a five to one ratio braid strap. In fact, there's nothing magic about it at all. A braid strap isn't very good anyway at the frequencies we use these days. A braid strap at a gigahertz is just a, uh, an antenna, you know. Um, anyway, they, uh, all braid straps have inductance and the best way to reduce inductance is to make it shorter because the inductance is proportional to the length. And the next, once you've got it as short as you possibly can, the next thing to do is make it as wide as you can because the inductance is proportional to the square root of the width. So if it can be an inch long and three inches wide, that's a wonderful braid strap, you know. Still not as good as a direct metal to metal bond though. Yep, I'll stop there. Okay. Um, since every digital transistor in an IC generates noise emissions by its operations and demodulates and intermodulates RF it is exposed to, doesn't this make EMC design very complicated? Well, yes, I mean, the, uh, the thing is there's just so many of these transistors. And so if you don't design with EMC in mind in the first place, you could end up in a horrible mess. And you try and fix it with, you know, uh, trying improving the bonding here and there. But what you tend to find is that you might make uh, half of the problem better, but the other half of the problem gets worse, or half the frequency range gets better and half the frequency range gets worse. The trick is to understand that these uh, things happen, like, like I've been talking about, you know, about transistors. And so what you do is you, you don't allow any frequencies into your integrated circuits that are outside the band you want them to operate over, you see. And then you don't get the demodulation, intermodulation and, and all that, all those sorts of problems. You, you control your, the radio frequency environment of each, each IC. That sounds difficult, but actually it's very easy to do on a printed circuit board with, with zero volt planes and maybe the odd little tin can here and there and board mounted filters. Um, and the tin cans in volume manufacture are very, are very cheap, very low cost. We don't like to use uh, shielded overall enclosures these days so much because uh, it makes the aesthetics um, difficult. You know, we can't make them look interesting and sexy. So it's, it does make things complicated if, if you didn't do good EMC design from the first. If you did do, do good EMC design from the first, understanding those things that the guy mentioned when he asked the question, then you find that uh, everything really is very simple. Does that help? Okay. We have received so many great questions that we will try to address in the future. Keith, thank you again for your time and expertise. Webinar attendees, if you have any more questions we didn't answer here, 
please send us an email at info at interferencetechnology.com. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website, interferencetechnology.com. A Q&A from all the questions that everybody has asked will also be on there too, so make sure you check that out. We will also send a link to all participants shortly. Thank you for attending.